Welcome to the GRIP seminar. My name is Narushige Michita. I teach international security affairs at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, based in Tokyo. I'll be hosting as your host, uh, I'll be serving as your host today. The United States and China are getting into a great power competition now, and that competition is taking place over trade, in the outer space, in the cyberspace, and of course, at sea. Even under this COVID-19 environment, China is acting aggressively in the East China Sea, South China Sea, and in other places. What can we do to keep this competition under control? In order to answer that question, we must learn lessons from the Cold War history. Today, we have invited the perfect person to do that, just that. Dr. David Winkler is Charles Lindbergh Fellow in Aerospace History at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum and the author of In the Incidents at Sea, American Confrontation and Cooperation with Russia and China, 1945 to 2016, published by the Naval Institute Press in 2017. Dr. Winkler and I first met in 2015, and we worked together on the project entitled Lessons of the Cold War in the Pacific. Our report and the joint session that we did with uh, Captain Peter Schwartz is available at the link I will send you in the chat box shortly. In this webinar, Dr. Winkler will discuss first how the peacetime confrontation at sea between the United States and the Soviet Union developed during the Cold War. Second, how those two superpowers managed or failed to manage the competition. And finally, how we might be able to learn lessons from the Cold War experience and use them to manage the ongoing confrontation between the United States and China. Dr. Winkler, the screen is yours. Well, thank you very much. And let me bring up my slides. So I need to uh, share screen and there we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, it, it is, uh, late night on Friday here on the eastern coast of the United States and there's a thunderstorm rolling in. So if, if the lights suddenly go out, you, you know, you, you'll understand what the problem is. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me uh, to the uh, uh, National Graduate Institute for Poly Studies. Uh, I'm actually today, I'm still with the Naval Historical Foundation. I start Tuesday with the uh, Smithsonian as their Charles Lindbergh Chair in Aerospace History. Uh, let me give you a little bit about a uh, background about myself. I'm a native of New Jersey. Uh, uh, for those unfamiliar with American geography, I'm, uh, that's in the shadow of New York City. Uh, I went to the Pennsylvania State University. I received a scholarship from the Navy to uh, go through their Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps. Uh, NROTC is the biggest producer of naval officers for the United States Navy next to the Naval Academy. At Penn State, I was a political science major and I was commissioned as a naval officer as an ensign in 1980. Uh, the gentleman, the, the admiral uh, pictured here is Vice Admiral Sam Gravely. He's the first African-American admiral uh, in the United States Navy. He served as my commissioning officer. Uh, when I entered the Navy, I was assigned uh, to the USS Suribachi. Uh, uh, ironically, I wound up going back to New Jersey where the Suribachi was homeported. The Suribachi was an ammunition ship, and we deployed quite a bit during those uh, years in the 1980s during the Cold War. We deployed 
during the three years from 1980 to uh, the end of 1983, I deployed to the Mediterranean for three six month uh, deployments. I was uh, sent down to the Caribbean, I think six times, and we did three North Atlantic cruises. Uh, while uh, from the uh, Suribachi, I then was uh, assigned to the Western Pacific on the USNS Navasota, a military sealift command uh, oiler, which is a civilian ship, but it has a military detachment to handle the communications. And I was the officer in charge of that military detachment. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time uh, based out of Subic Bay in the Philippines and Sasebo in Japan. And we deployed into the Indian Ocean and, and we spent quite a bit of time up in the sea of Japan. And it's on those two ships that gave me uh, my first exposure to the confrontation with the Soviet Navy. We uh, saw quite a bit of uh, Soviet warships in the Mediterranean and also during our exercises in the North Atlantic. Um, and uh, uh, with regards to the incidents at sea, I had, we, we had on the bridge of our ship a, um, uh, uh, the instance that C rules and regulations in the signal book. And that was a pass down item that uh, as you stood your watch, you turn that over to the next officer to deck and, and inventory to make sure you had that handy because we would run into the ships like this uh, Soviet uh, Cashin uh, frigate. And there was one day which uh, we, uh, one of these frigates came alongside and I noticed the forward gun mount was pointed straight at our bow. And I'm looking at the uh, bore of this uh, uh, ship, and I'm thinking to myself, this is a, clearly a violation of the Incidents at Sea Agreement, but I'm thinking this ship is, it's just a mere 100 yards off our starboard bow, and if it fires into an ammunition ship, uh, it's not only taking us out, but it's also taking itself out. So I, I don't think we reported that as an incident, but I'm thinking uh, modern day, if somebody was taking Today, uh, cell phone uh, video of that and uh, sending that back home to uh, Uncle Charlie, uh, and then that gets sent on to CNN, social media, uh, then, some, then it becomes an international incident. So that's the difference between then and today, okay? Uh, the second incident uh, that comes to mind is I was in the Sea of Japan, up, and it, during the Cold War, uh, the United States implemented something called the Maritime Strategy. John Lehman was the Secretary of the Navy, and he published a book, Oceans Ventured, recently. I re strongly recommend it. It talks about how the United States Navy uh, used naval exercises to get its uh, message across to the Soviet Union. And one of those exercises occurred in the Sea of Japan in 1984. I believe we had like three aircraft carrier battle groups targeting Vladivostok. Uh, and uh, it's during the, uh, this time in the uh, Sea of Japan where we have Soviet aircraft and ships flying around that I noticed us using uh, these signals from the Incidents at Sea ex uh, or agreement extensively. And it prevented the two sides from uh, ac uh, mi uh, miscommunications that could escalate into an accidental uh, situation and warfare. So that left an impression upon me so that when I got off, off of sea duty after five years at sea in, 19, uh, in the late 80s, I was assigned, I, I asked to be assigned to someplace that's a little, a little bit away from the waterfront. And the Navy complied, they sent me to St. Louis, Missouri, which is perhaps the farthest way you can, uh, from the ocean you could send somebody. And I was there to command a Naval Reserve Center, okay? So while I was in St. Louis, um, I had the opportunity to attend Washington University there. It's a, a very good college. And for my master's thesis in international affairs, I decided to look into the incidents at Sea Agreement. There was not much published at the time. Uh, fortunately, there was a, a retired naval officer by the name of Ron Kurth. Uh, uh, he was the president of Murray State University, which was a, a local, and I had a chance, locally uh, uh, in Kentucky, and I had a chance to interview him uh, and write a thesis about his experiences being on the delegation in 1972 that negotiated the agreement and later his service as our naval attache to Moscow. 
Uh, leaving active duty uh, uh, in 1990, I went into the reserves um, and uh, at the end of, uh, I completed my thesis. Now I had submitted some Freedom of Information Act request to get some documents from the State Department about a week after I uh, completed my uh, paper and, and got my degree, these boxes showed up at my door in St. Louis, with documents from the State Department talking about the negotiations. And I, I said to myself, wow, I got the makings of a, uh, of a dissertation here. And then uh, I contact, was contacted by Captain Jim Bryant. I had sent the Freedom of Information Act request to the Pentagon, and he called me up and says, you know, if you want these documents, why don't you come here to the Pentagon and work for me in my reserve unit. So I went to work for Captain Jim Bryant and basically uh, uh, had access to all the historical materials about the uh, US-Soviet relationship. And from there, I was able to write the, this dis dissertation on the Dr. Uh, Bob Beisner. And while I was there, I joined the staff of the Naval Historical Foundation, uh, an organization I've been associated with now for the past uh, quarter century. Uh, I have completed my dissertation in 1998. Uh, it was published by the Naval Institute Press originally in 2000 under the title Cold War at Sea. Um, the uh, Naval Institute Press uh, you know, uh, had a limited run. Uh, the Canadians uh, uh, decided, asked me for publication rights and they published the, the, the text in 2008 under the title Preventing Incidents at Sea, the History of the Ink Sea Concept. And then the Naval Institute came back to me and they said, you know, we're, we're still having incidents with, with Russia and with China. Maybe can you update your book? So I did, and it was published in uh, three years ago under the title Incidents at Sea. And, uh, uh, and I understand there's a uh, edition uh, is going to be published in Chinese uh, in the near future. So uh, what's in the book? Well, I, I give an overview of the relationship uh, uh, between the two navies in the 50s through the present. And during the 1950s, the Soviet in the Navy, it's, it's very coastal defense. Now, um, Stalin uh, uh, wanted a big Navy, uh, and he started uh, constructing a large fleet, but he died in 1953. So his successor, uh, uh, Nikita Khrushchev and his new uh, uh, fleet, Admiral Fleet, uh, Sergei Gorshkov, co concentrated on submarines and coastal defense. And the real, uh, the real uh, story in the 1950s is air incidents along the periphery. We'll talk a little bit about that more. 1960s, the Soviet Navy goes blue. It becomes a blue water Navy. And we see the uh, Soviet Navy deploying to all the world's oceans. And this is where they come in contact with the United States Navy. There's incidents, protests, counter protests. So we'll talk about some of, about those, some of those incidents. And then in the 1970s, uh, there's negotiations for the incidents at sea agreement. The Soviets now are approaching parity with the United States, uh, demonstrating their capabilities to do these global exercises, both the in 70 and 75. The 1980s is known, as I mentioned, the US maritime strategy. Uh, to put pressure on the Soviet peripheries. Uh, the end of the Cold War, 1990s, is, is pretty much uh, the United States uh, Pax Americana. And now we have the 2000 to the present, the uh, rise of the Chinese People's Liberation Army Navy and the reemergence of the Russian Navy. So getting back to the historical background, the 1950s, uh, in, the, in my book, I document all these sh uh, shootdowns along the Soviet periphery where we're sending aircraft, you know, to, uh, we, we knew nothing about the Soviet U Union at the, after World War II, uh, uh, and the Soviets had uh, developed the atomic bomb, and, we're, and we were trying to find out information about their capabilities, and it's, it, it's a big country, so... Uh, uh, we are scouting along the periphery, and the Soviets do not like this. They come up, and on occasion, they're shooting down our surveillance aircraft. Okay, and I, I document these uh, cases in the book. Now, it's, it's a two-way street. Uh, there are a couple cases where the United States shot down Soviet aircraft, okay? And the, these, both of these incidents are kind of related to the Korean War, where the Soviet aircraft were flying in the vicinity of uh, North Korea. If you notice that last date, uh, 
actually it should be July 7th, uh, 1953. Uh, that was the date the uh, uh, Korean uh, armistice uh, occurred. Uh, the uh, U.S. shot down a uh, passenger aircraft near Port, Port Arthur. What happened in the 1960s uh, was satellite reconnaissance alleviated the need for us to do these reconnaissance missions. Now, we still have planes go along the Soviet periphery today, but uh, the, uh, the Soviets now understand that uh, uh, they're being, uh, we can see them from above okay, through various types of uh, satellites. So, um, you know, we, uh, the other event that happens in the 1960s is the development of ballistic missile submarines. And of course we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. These two events, uh, the Soviets realized that they, they, they have to go beyond a coastal defense force. If they're gonna defend the Soviet Union against ballistic missile submarines, um, they need a blue water navy, okay. And initially, our ballistic missile submarines had to, uh, you know, had to stay within like within 800 to 1,000 miles of the Soviet Union. So they deployed to like the Mediterranean, uh, North Sea. Of course, now uh, you know they can fire their missiles from uh, almost anywhere on the planet. Uh, the ranges has increased that much. Uh, as I mentioned, the Soviet Navy and our Navy started to meet on the high seas and you had uh, a lot of buzzings. Now, what, what I mean by buzzings is where we had our aircraft coming off our aircraft carriers would fly very low on the Soviet ships and uh, at supersonic speeds and the sonic booms would, uh, I've ex I once experienced this uh, on board the ammunition ship where our, doing an exercise, we simulated being a Soviet uh, cruiser, and we were attacked by the air wing off the USS John F. Kennedy, and we were buzzed, and it, it's a very unpleasant experience. Uh, um, and I understand one case, uh, a Soviet cruiser, actually the, the fire bricks and the boilers were cracked, and they had to go back for repairs uh, due to the damage uh, done. Now, uh, the Soviets, in turn, uh, their ships, and they had uh, small frigates, a lot of these uh, converted fishing air, uh, ships, they, they call the intelligence collection ships, AGIs. Uh, they would interfere with uh, aircraft uh, flight operations. As you know, aircraft carriers have to turn into the wind. Uh, underway replenishments is a very delicate operation where you know two ships, are, uh, and I was on two underway replenishment ships, and if a ship uh, passes in front of you, that's a very t uh, ticky, uh, ticklish situation to evade. So there's two case studies I talk about. Um, there is, in the May of uh, 67, we had the USS Hornet has a, uh, it's an anti-submarine warfare aircraft carrier operating in the sea of Japan. And uh, it's, uh, it has uh, the stories that screen it while it's uh, aircraft are searching out Soviet submarines. And I think that there was a Soviet destroyer that tried to, uh, to break into the screen to try and interfere with these operations. And they were shouldered by the USS Walker on uh, two successive days. Two different Soviet destroyers collided into this. Uh, uh, they had these collisions. You can see a picture of uh, one of the uh, collisions above. And, you know, letters of protest between the, the Soviets and the American, and, you know, embassies went back and forth. Uh, our minority speaker in the House of Representatives at the time was Gerald R. Ford, and he's asking, you know, we need to change our rules of engagement that if we have one of these shoulder in incidents that we should fire uh, on the Soviet ships to which uh, Admiral Gorshkov uh, in the Soviet Navy is calling Ford a warmonger. And, uh, you know, but you can see how this talk can escalate uh, into a situation which, which uh, neither side really wanted to get themselves into. And uh, to further illustrate, there's a situation on the May the 25th, 1968, where a ba Badger Maritime Patrol aircraft approaches the USS Essex, which is operating in the North Sea, and is flying so low along the water that uh, 
there's a airplane that's getting ready to take off on the Essex uh, and it's, it's being held, it's being held. And then the pilot looks ahead of the bow and sees the red star of the uh, Soviet aircraft fly right by. It was flying that low. The problem was is that this Badger was flying so low across the North Sea that when the plane decided to turn, the, the wing tip tipped into the water and the aircraft cartwheeled into the ocean. Now, you know, uh, this could give the appearance that, uh, you know, the Americans shot down this aircraft. And you know, you, you know, you could have misintentions, and it escalates into a situation where you, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it con uh, you have confrontation. You know, the Essex immediately radioed Washington. There was an American destroyer near a Soviet destroyer a hundred miles away that sent the message, uh, and uh, the Soviets understood what happened. The Americans recovered the body, and uh, there was a commander, Edward Day, who would actually return the remains to uh, the uh, a, a Soviet destroyer. There was a missing man formation overflown. It, it, it was, it, it, everything was done very honor, honorably. But with that, the United States uh, approaches the Soviet Union and says, you know, we ought to have safety at sea talks. And every time we approach the Soviet Union about safety at sea talks, the Soviets would rebuff us. Well, until uh, uh, the 10th of November, 1970, the day before, the, there was actually a collision between a Soviet destroyer and the British aircraft carrier Ark Royal off of Crete, and the incident caused uh, the death of four Soviet sailors. The next day, the Soviets approached the United States and said, you know, those safety at sea talks, maybe that's a good idea after all. And this actually surprised the Americans because we weren't really expecting the Soviets to say yes. Uh, and it took about, uh, oh, uh, you know, nine months for the United States to really get its act together to figure out what, what do we really want to, from uh, a, a safety at sea talks. Yeah, there are actually uh, many uh, officers in the United States Navy who totally oppose the idea of having uh, relations with the Soviet Navy. You know, they look down on the Soviets. You know, why, why should we talk to, to those guys? But, uh, you know, safety uh, was an issue, and they did not want to have one of these incidents uh, escalated to war. So, you know, they wound up having these uh, initial round of discussions in Moscow of 1971. And during the, the, the round of negotiations in 1971, there was an announcement that there would be a summit in, in Moscow in 1972 between Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev. And uh, uh, the assistant delegate head of uh, State Department uh, ambassador by the name of Herb Okinson this is great because when uh, leaders of countries get together, they like to sign agreements. So the head of our delegation, by the way, was Under Secretary of Navy John W. Warner. Um, he would later uh, uh, become the Secretary of the Navy to sign the agreement when it was uh, signed in Moscow in 1972. Um, there was a second uh, meeting in, in Washington to finalize uh, before the Moscow summit. Uh, and during that, there was a scare in that we had the war in Vietnam going, and uh, we mined Haiphong Harbor in response to the uh, North Vietnamese Easter Offensive. Um, why, and this all occurred while the Soviets uh, were negotiating the agreement. And there were some of the Soviet delegations, you know, we would have walked out, but uh, Vice Admiral Kazatonov said, nope. Uh, you know, we're here to do business, let the politicians decide, uh, you know, these matters, you know, we, we need to get this uh, agreement done. So the agreement is signed in Moscow as part of the uh, Nixon Brezhnev summit uh, in the uh, uh, May 25th, uh, 1972, uh, actually four years after that uh, incident in the North Sea. And the agreement regulates behavior between the two sides. As I mentioned, you're not supposed to point weapons, uh, flash uh, your searchlights, fly over your bomb bay, door is open. There's a, 
uh, there you abide by the rules of road, there's communications, there's uh, signals that are were designed to show you what you're intent to do, uh, and you report your violations through naval attache. So if there's, a, if there's an issue, you, you, use your, you don't go through the embassies like in, in the past where you send a, uh, uh, a demarche, you, you actually send a complaint through the naval attaches, and these uh, violations are then reviewed at an annual review. And uh, uh, there was a protocol in 1973 that extended these, uh, the agreement to the merchant auxiliaries of both ships. Uh, the, the agreement was implemented. Uh, the first real test was the 1973 October War in the Middle East, where you had uh, both the, the Soviet Navy and the United States Navy crowded the Eastern Mediterranean uh, to support uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, and Israel, you know, their respective sides. And, uh, you know, their, uh, the behavior demonstrated that, uh, you know, it's, it's a situation with all these warships, it, it could have escalated, did not. Um, there was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Now, what was unique about that was the United States decided to cut off all its uh, uh, military to military relations we had with the Soviet Union, except for this incident at Sea Agreement. This was kept quiet. We're going we're gonna to keep meeting with the Soviets. Um, of course, during this period, the United States is continuing doing freedom of navigation exercises. We'll talk a little bit more about that. There is the KLL uh, shoot down in 1983. Uh, KAL. KAL, yes. Uh, and that uh, uh, the Soviets interfere with the recovery uh, operations. And, and at this point, the United States says, you know, if you, you are serious about this agreement, uh, cut it out. And the, and the Soviets did, to their credit. There is a shooting in 1985 of a U.S. naval, a U.S. Army attaché uh, in East Germany, and uh, the Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger wants to shut down the uh, bilateral relations. The talks get delayed for six months as, as a result of that. And then there's this 1988 Karen Yorktown incident. Okay, we'll talk about that. The picture, by the way, is an uh, Soviet Echo II class submarine ramming the stern of the USS Vogi. It's a frigate in the eastern uh, Med uh, GNC in 1975. Um, and this wasn't counted as an incident at sea because uh, the, the agreement does not uh, apply to submerged ships. They did talk about this, about doing the, uh, uh, the annual review, though. Now, just for clarification, KLA uh, stands for Korean Airliner. That, that's Not right. Everybody understands what it is. Oh, Good. <laughs> just in case. Thanks. I, I, I try to avoid, <laughs> you know, uh, using, uh, uh, you know, the, the, this. Thank, thank you for that. Okay. So in, in February 1988, we had this uh, these two collisions in the Black Sea, and this is something that we, we might want to take a look at uh, because there are contemporary implications here. The United States, and, and actually two years before 1986, the Karen and the uh, Yorktown, the, uh, the two American ships, did something called uh, the uh, Innocent Passage, okay? you have the right to pass through territorial waters. If there is a peninsula sticking out from your coastline, you can go from point A to point B as a shortcut. You don't have to go around the 12 miles. Uh, so you have, you know, it's called innocent passage. And so the United States, uh, you know, demonstrated through this freedom and navigation exercise, it's right to conduct freedom, uh, innocent passage through this Soviet territorial water in 1986. And the Soviets responded by passing a law in their uh, parliament, uh, you know, saying that this is illegal. Well, it, that's against international law. So of course that just invited the United States to continue doing it. And here in 1988, we're demonstrating 
the freedom of navigation to do innocent passage. And the Soviets are uh, showing their objection by ramming our uh, two ships, okay? This is, this is going to be resolved uh, at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in the United States, between the foreign ministers of the two countries. And the agreement is, is that the Soviet uh, legislature will rescind the law. And then in the United States, because the law is no longer in existence, uh, will say, well, we don't have need to demonstrate the innocent passage, okay? So that, that's, uh, that's uh, something. Now, this actually is not an incidence at sea because, of course, the incidence at sea agreement is uh, incidence on the high seas, and that's the 12-mile you know, uh, territorial water boundary. So this is actually in Soviet uh, waters. Okay, the end of the Cold War. Um, there, oh, by the way, in the 1980s, other countries decided to have bilateral agreements with the Soviet Union. First, uh, the British in 1986, and then once the British have one, of course, the French have got to have one. Um, and then Belgium, uh, uh, Holland, Norway, it, uh, the list goes on. Uh, it's about a dozen countries. I believe Japan signed an agreement with, uh, uh, with the Soviet Union during this, this period. The annual reviews, even though the Cold War is over, they will continue. But what's going to happen is, and this is where I'm now uh, working with Captain Jim Bryant uh, and making preparations for the annual reviews, is there's no incidents happening at the high seas. The Soviet Navy has now, is now the Russian Navy, and it, it, the Navy is not operating on the high seas. Meanwhile, the United States Navy is not operating off the Soviet periphery or the Russian periphery. It's now operating in the Middle East because we have, uh, you know, problems uh, in the uh, Aegean with the Balkans, and we have problems uh, with, uh, you know, Iraq uh, following the Gulf War in 1990. So, you know, the two navies aren't even coming into contact. So what, what we're doing now is we have this uh, agreement, this instance at sea agreement in place as really an excuse to have Navy to Navy staff talks where the two sides will meet for a half hour. They'll say, okay, we have had any uh, incidents this year. Let's talk about something else. Let's, uh, let's grow our re relationship, okay? Uh, so we'll talk about mutual training opportunities. We'll talk about uh, different uh, uh, humanitarian assistance uh, exercises. And this is how the two navies interact in the, during the 1990s. There are ship visits, the two sides, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Soviet, the Russians now, and the U.S. will go, you know, visit each other's ports. And uh, uh, so, the, you know, the 1990s is a relatively... Um, peaceful time uh, as far as U.S.-Russian naval relations. Uh, there is uh, on, of course, uh, the U.S. Navy and the People's Liberation Army Navy have an interaction in 1994 uh, in the uh, Taiwan Straits. Uh, you know, a Chinese submarine is tailing a U.S. aircraft carrier. Actually, it was a you know, wonderful training opportunity for both navies. But this interaction made the, uh, the newspapers and like the Los Angeles Times, and there was a discussion, well, maybe we need to have an instance at sea agreement with, Ch with China. Uh, that uh, discussions, uh, some initial uh, talks occurred, but they were put off at the Taiwan Straits crisis in 1996, where the United States, you know, uh, sold arms to uh, uh, Taiwan and the, the Chinese uh, broke off military uh, communications. That, that opened up, though, in 1997. And finally, in 1998, uh, the two sides some, signed something called the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement. Now, uh, remember we were talking about uh, those uh, Soviet, I mean, the Russian and the U.S. Navy uh, staff talks. Um, that's kind of the model with the, uh, we were looking at. We the problem with uh, this term incidents at sea is it implied an adversarial relationship. And that's not what uh, the United States was looking for in the 1990s with regards to the People's Republic of China. You know, uh, we wanted to, you know, continue, you know, building uh, economic relations 
and confrontation was not the direction that uh, the uh, uh, Clinton White House was, uh, was looking, Clinton administration was looking for. So the idea is we want to do things like uh, talk to the, the Chinese about uh, uh, you know safety at sea, uh, 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 talk about um, uh, rescues, uh, talk about training opportunities, um, and if there if there is a, some sort of incident, you know this could be the type of forum that uh, they use. So you don't have this mechanism, you don't have signals like you had in the instance at sea agreement. You don't have the use of naval attaches as you had in the instance at uh, uh, sea agreement. The other thing uh, which is made kind of difficult with, with China is uh, the instance at sea talks about the high seas uh, and you had this thing occur in 1982 uh, subsequent to the 1972 instance of sea agreement called the um, um, United States, United Nations uh, Convention on Law of the Sea, which established this 200 mile economic exclusion zone. And, you know, the, this is where um, it becomes a little difficult between China and the United States on what constitutes the high seas. Because uh, the Chinese view has been that, okay, uh, we, uh, we have some semblance of sovereignty over these waters, all right? Now, there's also something else going on during this time period is that there's a, uh, let's see, a Western Pacific uh, Naval Symposium. It's a, it's a group of um, every two years or so, leaders from the uh, navies of the along the Western Pacific Rim will get together and you know discuss uh, issues of mutual interest. And from this, there is a proposal floated, I think it was from New Zealand, uh, to come up with a code of unplanned encounters at sea, cues, all right? And this is adopted uh, by the group and it's, for, uh, and it's formalized in Beijing in 2014. And this is a, a, a set of signals that actually are much more extensive than what you had in the instance at Sea Agreement. So now you have a mechanism that uh, copies what you had with the instance at Sea Agreement with the ability of the, the two navies to signal uh, each other what their intentions are. And then there's a bilateral uh, Ministry of Defense, Department of Defense agreement uh, in November 14th of 2014 that uh, establishes that the two navies will use uh, the, this cues as a signaling mechanism and that they will use the MMCA, the Military Maritime Mutual Consultative Agreement as a means to uh, discuss uh, these incidents. So the mechanisms from the incidents at sea agreement between the Soviet Union, Russian Navy, and the United States, and now uh, China and the United States have been replicated uh, through these, uh, you know, uh, through these different processes. As far as implementation, I have a, a good friend who lives in the neighborhood by the name of uh, Commander Whitten Smith. And he was a commanding officer of a Arleigh Burke destroyer. And he talked about running into a uh, Chinese uh, frigate uh, a few years ago. And he discussed the fact that they use these signals uh, there uh, uh, correctly with courtesy. And uh, uh, for the most part, relations between the United States and China, as far as when they, they approach each other on, uh, in situations, uh, all my, my understanding is that, you know, the signals are used, the, the two navies are very pro professional in, in the conduct of how they use those, those uh, they communicate with each other. Uh, now, back on the other side of the world, the, the Russian Navy is now coming back out and has challenged uh, us in the Black Sea. Um, here is the Donald Cook. It's an American Arleigh Burke destroyer that was buzzed by uh, Russian aircraft uh, in April of, of 2014. And I met with the uh, commanding officer. And this is, again, now 
we have people taking uh, video with their cell phones, sending it off. And this became a crisis uh, that the uh, Obama White House had to respond to. And people were asking, why didn't this guy shoot, uh, why didn't this captain uh, of the ship shoot down the Russian aircraft? Okay, so, uh, you know, so what's, so now the Europeans are now re-looking at the incidents at sea agreement because you have all these bilateral agreements. And two years ago, there was a, a, a forum at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe that uh, discussed, well, maybe what we have to do in Europe is take a look at what they've done in Asia. You know, with their Western Naval, uh, uh, Western Pacific Naval Symposium, uh, with the implementation of cues as, as a multilateral measure and uh, the use of the uh, Western Pacific Naval Symposium as a forum to discuss, uh, you know, incidents. Maybe we need to do this uh, in Europe. Uh, and the Europeans are now looking at uh, uh, the, the Asian model as something worthy of replication. So with that, I think we'll open it up for uh, comments and then uh, some questions. All right, thank you very much uh, for your talk. So uh, we will open the screen for Q and A and discussion shortly. But uh, uh, while uh, people uh, think about their questions, uh, let me ask you four basic questions. Uh, first, uh, so given what you have just said. Um, um, it seems that the intensity of the confrontation during the Cold War is much worse or about much higher than what's going on today. I mean, a lot of uh, U.S. Uh, aircraft getting shut down, whereas the, the worst case, you know, um, incident that happened in the re recent years has been uh, EP3 incident of 2001, in which EP-3 or, you know, Chinese uh, fighter aircraft collided with the EP-3, but uh, EP-3 survived in the end. So do you agree with the contention that uh, actually the current situation is better than what we were experiencing during the Cold War? But at the same time, I think they must be uh, things that, uh, uh, and there are things that are actually better uh, than the, during the Cold War, and but there must be the areas uh, where things are actually the situation is worse uh, today than during the Cold War. So can you talk about those? Uh, and, yes. Uh, and uh, let me just finish uh, questions. Um, second question would be: uh, so the it seems that the Soviets uh, were acting quite aggressively during the Cold War. And my question is, uh, how did the United States, or especially U.S. Navy, uh, respond to it? Uh, did it respond um, very strongly to the Soviet actions, or did it try to respond softly in a you know, kind of a restrained manner? And uh, so what kind of approach uh, produced good results and uh, what kind of approach produced bad results so that we can learn lessons. Third question would be, um, so there are a lot of similarities, certainly differences between what was, what we are, you know, what was going on during the Cold War and what's going on today. So if we in superimpose what we are seeing today, like a Sino-US competition at sea, and have it, you know, kind of superimpose it to the uh, Cold War history, where are we today? Are we in the 1950s? Are we in the 1960s? Are we in the 1970s? And, you know, and if we are in the 1970s, well, well um, so, uh, and uh, so China is uh, kind of implementing its uh, our own Cold War strategy at sea. And uh, what, how should we be responding to it? Uh, should we, we be responding to it more strongly or more softly? Or, you know, what, what will be um, the two or three things that we should be doing uh, with regard to our response uh, to China? 
And finally, uh, so you talked about um, some, you know, agreements and uh, uh, other things between the U.S. and China, uh, namely 1998 Military Maritime Consultative Agreement, and the second 2014, uh, you know, cues are uh, called for unplanned encounters at CCUECS, uh, which was a multi multinational agreement and uh, 2014 bilateral uh, US-China Safety at Sea Memorandum of Understanding. So how are these uh, functioning in your opinion? Are they working very well? Or if not, if um, they are, um, so that's a good news, but if they are not, uh, what should we be doing uh, in addition to those uh, three agreements, when maybe we do you think it's a good idea for us to establish a, for the US to establish a direct Navy to Navy communication mechanism using uh, naval attaches, for example, as uh, you or uh, we did during the Cold War. Okay. Okay, well, well first, uh, as far as the uh, uh, Cold War, uh, definitely on a daily basis during the 1960s, uh, you know, uh, there were incidents occurring, these buzzings, uh, shouldering incidents, uh, and it was just uh, cowboys and Cossacks, I guess we used to call it, uh, on the high seas. And uh, uh, both sides uh, misbehaved. Now, as far as the way the United States, uh, it, so it was worse then than anything you see today between Russia and the United States or China and the United States, as far as uh, dangerous uh, activities. The only concern you have today is that if you have uh, one of these uh, incidents, uh, it's, everybody is taking pictures on their, uh, mm. you know, uh, on their, their phones, and that's going to make it to the mass media. Okay, now, in some, the concern I have now uh, nowadays is that the uh, uh, used to be when there was an incident at sea, the two sides would document it and they would uh, send it back to their respective naval headquarters and it would be discussed quietly uh, during the annual review and nobody in the public ever got wind that an incident ever occurred. Today, uh, we see and when something happens, video immediately is sent by one side or the other to their respective uh, media uh, and I think there, you, you, it, it kind of undermines the whole purpose of it having an agreement because you know, the uh, both sides are now playing out their case in the, in the court of public opinion rather than uh, so when you the two sides will actually get together for an annual review, there's not much left to discuss. It's all been discussed in the court of public opinion. You know they might. Uh, 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 you know, I, I, and, and that's a concern I have uh, today with this, uh, the, the social media and, and using these incidents to score, uh, uh, I guess, political points uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, appeal to a, a national consensus. And you see this a lot with Russia and the United States. Uh, uh, you know, these, there's video that immediately goes on Russian media. And so we have to counter and put it on our media. So that's uh, answering number one. Number two, as far as aggression is concerned, the American commanders uh, acted differently uh, uh, it, 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 by personality. In some cases, mm -hmm. uh, I know Admiral Holloway uh, uh, would say, okay, uh, I'm in command of an aircraft carrier, turn my aircraft carrier into that uh, Russian uh, uh, trawler, I'm going to show this guy who's boss. And when you're uh, uh, in a 85,000 ton uh, warship versus a, you know, just a few thousand ton uh, trawler, 
that troll is going to get out of the way or he's going to get chopped up. So it's quite a, quite often that might be the reaction from the aircraft carrier. Let's swipe this guy aside. But there, there are other uh, captains I uh, talked to who said, you know, let's not, uh, let's think about what's going to happen here. And they would turn the other cheek. So the, the uh, reaction uh, varied by personality. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, there was one uh, incident I uncovered where uh, a, a captain was told, I need to get this Soviet uh, ship away from the formation. So he sent uh, the captain of the ship, sent out these two sailors with a bed spring uh, from one of the beds. And they started lowering the bed spring off the side and pulling it up. And the guy would be there with a clipboard making notes. And the Soviet AGI came over to see what these guys were doing. And they went off into the distance and, and kept the Russians away from the formation. So, you know, there, there were very clever ways to handle this. Smart trick. Uh, yeah. the, uh, uh, as far as, let's see, uh, the, uh, yeah, what's the situation today? Well, with, with China, uh, I would say we're in the 1980s as far as having an mm-hmm. agree- agreement in place uh, with uh, signals and communications with the Navy. Now, the thing about China, which is a little, uh, uh, is the Chinese are stovepiped, okay, where you have different agencies acting kind of independently of each other. So we... We have very good uh, communications with the People's Liberation Army Navy. As far as their fisheries patrol and their Coast Guard, uh, they report to, di- and, and, you know, the different uh, provinces have their own maritime forces. Uh, there's, there seems to be a lack of coordination between the, uh, <laughs> the, the different uh, uh, Chinese agencies and uh, and that's where there's there's a concern there because while the Chinese Navy might be 1980s, with some of these other uh, maritime agencies, it might be like 1960s. And, and you see these incidents in the uh, South China Sea with collisions with you know other coast guards and uh, you know fishing fleets. So th- that's uh, you know a difference there is that. Um, the agreements we have with the P- People's Liberation Army Navy and the Ministry of Defense are between those two agencies. It's not with the whole of China. So that's, uh, you know, that's a concern. Uh, let's see. I think that uh, addressed the, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, as far as the, the one problem we've had with the Chinese um, is that the, Incidents at Sea Agreement, they have met every year. There was that one exception I mentioned with uh, uh, Weinberger, who uh, can't you know, put off the uh, 85 talks for six months because he was upset with the uh, murder of Major Nicholson. But the, the Russians and the United States have been pretty good about meeting every year. I don't know if they've met this year yet due to the COVID-19 uh, situation. They met last year in Washington. Uh, a problem I noticed with the uh, 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 the uh, NMCA is that the Chinese, on occasion, will uh, express uh, dissatisfaction with their relations with the United States. Usually, it's arms sales with Taiwan, and they'll cut off military to military relations. And when they cut off military to military relations, that means we're not talking to the uh, uh, our our plenary and working group meetings that are set up with the, under the MMCA. So, so sometimes uh, those get put off. So that, that's the concern I have. Uh, this is a difference between the incidents at sea agreement and the uh, MMCA. Mm-hmm. The incidents at sea agreement is an executive agreement between the president of the United States and the uh, premier of the Soviet Union. So that, that, that is at the highest level Whereas uh, the MMCA is uh, Ministry of Defense level, so mm. uh, if the uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the they they continue to meet under the Incidents at Sea Agreement because it is a higher level agreement. 
So that, I uh, wrote an article in the Canadian Naval Review back in 2014, arguing that uh, they ought to consider a, uh, I guess, a remarriage where they upgrade the level of the agreement to like an ex uh, you know, executive head of state, and, and that might uh, take care of that, uh, of that problem. I see. All right. Thank you very much. Let's open the uh, screen to the viewers. And uh, uh, so you sh uh, I would like you got, um, the attendees to uh, raise your hands uh, virtually. And how to do it, you have to first press uh, the participants button in Japanese, sankasha button at the bottom or somewhere in, on the screen and open the uh, box, uh, participants box, and at the, I think in, at the bottom, uh, there is a button saying, uh, raise your hand, or sube te o ageru in Japanese. So press that, then uh, I can see you raising your hand. So let's take uh, two questions first. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Niranjan. Um, there we go. Go ahead, Yuranja. Uh, can you un? Yes, Professor. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, thank you so much, and thank you so much, uh, Doctor uh, Winkle, for giving us such a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question, a little bit. By the way, can you identify yourself before you ask your question? Uh, professor, I'm uh, Naranjan Pratap Singh from India. Uh, I'm currently doing a maritime safety and security uh, program uh, with uh, GRIPS and Japan Coast Guard, the support of uh, uh, JICA. Uh, Professor, uh, thank you so much for giving us such a wonderful presentation. My question is a little bit similar to the third question of uh, Professor Michisita. Uh, uh, as we know that uh, Cold War is ended, and uh, but still, uh, what do you think, like uh, uh, Cold War at sea is going on? Because uh, uh, just before the Cold War, and clause has come, and we know that uh, U.S. Uh, codified the internet, international customary law, but not yet ratified it. Uh, on, on another side, China has ratified the um, UNCLOS, but not following it, and uh, freedom of navigation operations going on in South China Sea. Uh, classes in like uh, oil tankers in 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 Middle Middle East. Or Mediterranean Sea class between uh, U.S. and Russia is still going on. So where are we? Is still the Cold War at sea is going on, or uh, we can see the confrontation. And so the second part of question is, but what about what about the cooperation? So these two questions are there. Thank you so much. Yes, um, yeah, the, it is uh, uh, quite a. Uh, conundrum we have because, of course, the United States is yet to ratify uh, the uh, UNCLOS because we, there's some issues with the uh, seabed mining provisions in the accord. Uh, but uh, otherwise, the United States has you know, agreed to support all aspect, other aspects uh, of, of, of the agreement. Uh, this is going to be uh, something that has to be, I guess, handled, uh, I guess, through regional cooperation or, you know, or, uh, you know, the South Asian, you know, consortium of nations to try to work out, uh, you know, the differences that as far as, uh, you know, developing who, you know, the, the South China Sea, uh, you know, you have uh, in, in that, you know, I guess the issue here is mining, how much oil is available, and and how do you divvy that up? And and that is, you know, it's it's frankly the United States, it, it, you know, it, it does not have an interest there as far as the mineral rights because it's you know so far. But the regional nations have, and uh, you know, this is this is something that's going to have to be worked out. I I think on a regional basis. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um... So would you like to, let's go to uh, John Bradford. Go ahead. You have to unmute your, yourself. I thought I did that. Can you hear me now? Good, yeah. 
Hey, Dr. Winkler, this is uh, John Bradford. I'm also a retired, well, a former surface warfare officer, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm now a visiting uh, scholar uh, at Grips. Uh, I've done uh, a fair amount of work in cooperation in maritime Asia. So that's sort of the perspective that I bring to this question. Uh, I've read your book. It's been a few years. Um, and I'm sure if I read it again, it would come to, I would bring different perspectives and I would, different things would jump out to me uh, than when I did it a few years ago. One thing that you just said that jumped out to me that kind of surprised me. Uh, so I was hoping you could explain a little bit more uh, is you talked about a, a decision where we, the United States and the Soviet Union negotiated a position where the Soviet Union would withdraw uh, a domestic legislation dealing with innocent passage and in return, the United States would not exercise innocent passage in those waters. Uh, this really strikes me as surprising. I mean, on one hand, it seems to be uh, rational decision-making to de-escalate a situation or find a compromise. Um, but on the other hand, uh, this is the only example I can think of of the United States saying, I will not exercise my freedoms of navigation anywhere. Um, and so, you know, first of all, did I, did I understand that? Or is there more of a backstory? Uh, uh, second, are there, are there mm -hmm. other examples of when the United States has told other countries, we're going to voluntarily not exercise certain unclose privileges? Um, and I guess the final part of that question is, if so, um, is that kind of precedent something that people should look at as maybe a compromised position with China today? Yeah, that's uh, the second part of the question. I don't uh, know of another case. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I, uh, my understanding is that this agreement was uh, a verbal that was done at Jackson Hole between uh, I think it was George Shultz and Edwin Chevron, Nazi, uh, the foreign, Soviet foreign minister, is that uh, uh, it, it, that would resolve the the, the issue, um, and we wouldn't challenge the you know the, basically the, you know the Soviets made this point you're not going they put this law in so we decided to challenge it through freedom of navigation. Um, now. Uh, what I'm uh, implying when I mention that is okay. The, uh, the China has popped up. The, you know, they they poured a lot of sand into the South China Sea to create these little bastions uh, that on uh, on would, would just uh, you know they weren't really islands. They were just outcroppings. And now they're saying, okay, we we want our 12 mile uh, territorial limit. Well, that. That might be the uh, solution because as long as the Chinese say 12 mile territorial limit, we don't recognize these outcroppings uh, as, as, as territory. So we're, we're gonna be doing these freedom of navigation uh, uh, passages uh, and we'll continue to do so. Um, and we, I hope that uh, other navies uh, will uh, join us in doing so uh, to you know, demonstrate uh, you know, this, this violation of, uh, you know, in close, but, you know, maybe if China says, well, maybe we won't uh, declare 12 miles, you know, maybe the United States has no reason to uh, uh, dis demonstrate its uh, right to, for freedom of navigation. So, you know, some things, agreements can be made that uh, uh, need not be put down on paper. I'll leave it at that. All right. Are you okay with that? Okay. Is there? Yeah, I'm, other... I, I'm okay. great. I want to hear. I want to hear smarter questions, uh, so I can learn some more things. Thank you very much for that. Uh, really good answer. Great. Okay. All right. So, is there any other question? If not, uh, let me actually show you uh, this. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, Dr. Winkler's book in Chinese, and uh, which was published in 2015. And uh, so you were telling us, Dr. Winkler, you, uh, the, your uh, updated uh, book will be published in Chinese. So um, that's my understanding. Uh, 
yeah, can you tell us how it came about? Because I was a little shocked when you first uh, referred me to this uh, Chinese version of your book, uh, because the Chinese, you know, they are learning, right? Uh, learning yeah. from you and um, learning a lot and uh, quickly catching up with uh, uh, international standards. Whereas, you know, um, I don't know uh, how many people have read your book in English, but there is no uh, Japanese translation. So that's a kind of shame. And that actually, actually was a part of the reason why I wanted to invite you to this uh, GRIP seminar today and uh, to get uh, uh, Japanese uh, specialists know about your works and, the, uh, and you. So could you tell us uh, how this, you know, publication or Chinese translation of uh, the previous version of your book and the new version of you, your book came about? Well, the, uh, uh, the previous book is a, uh, a Chinese uh, uh, translation of the book from Dalhousie University uh, that uh, uh, Dave Griffiths, who is the uh, was the project officer up at Dalhousie, traveled to China and gave several briefings and uh, brief talked about the book and, and got the Chinese, I uh, uh, think it's the uh, uh, Chinese uh, Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing uh, to publish it. Uh, so that, that occurred. Now the Naval Institute Press uh, received a request from a Chinese publisher uh, two years ago uh, for uh, interest in publication. And I asked the Naval Institute Press just the other day, where is that? And the Naval Institute Press indicates to me that, well, uh, in the past two years, relations with the uh, their Chinese counterpart haven't been that good. So mm -hmm. they're, they're not uh, too sure where the, the, the book is in the pipeline. Uh -huh. So uh, I'd like, to, I'm looking forward to getting a copy of it someday. I know, yeah, and uh, but anyways, um, the, you have the previous book uh, version of your book uh, out in Chinese, and actually, I I tried to get uh, hold of it and uh, tried to buy it, but uh, it was out of print. So many people seems to have bought them already. So there seems to be a lot of interest in what you have been um, kind of uh, uh, studying. That, that's right. Yeah, yeah. There it is. Oh, get it. You didn't, you know, last time I asked, I, you didn't have a copy. Yeah. When did you well, get I got it? one. Oh, okay. That's good. Okay. I uh, wanted to. And uh, so let me actually ask you some uh, follow up uh, questions. One is that um, uh, in your presentation, uh, in my understanding of what you are kind of suggesting with you know, uh, without explicitly saying so, was that, uh, you know, uh, collisions and uh, some incidents actually induced uh, the Soviets uh, to come to the negotiating table. So um, it might be that uh, sometimes crises uh, produce, can produce good results. And uh, so, you know, what's going on in the East China Sea, South China Sea recently might produce good results. What do you think? And that's the first question. And another question is uh, related to uh, uh, Ink Sea, but a little different. Uh, in 1989, the US and the Soviet Union uh, agreed on the kind of uh, signed an agreement uh, called the prevention of dangerous military activities. Uh, and uh, how was it different from INCSI agreement and uh, how has it been working? Okay. Uh, no, you're right. Uh, and, and it, you know, incidents usually do. Uh, in, in the case of the, uh, it was a collision between a British aircraft carrier and a uh, Soviet destroyer that led the uh, Soviets to uh, uh, reconsider their uh, negative approach on the idea of safety at sea. And it could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe a catastrophic incident occurs uh, with loss of life in the South China Sea that maybe will wake up, uh, 
you know, the leaders of region, uh, some of the regional powers that something needs to be done. Uh, I, I hope it doesn't it, it take uh, uh, that sort of incident, uh, uh, you know, the, the promulgate something. Uh, with regards to the dangerous military activities, the, the, the problem with that, well, it wasn't a, a problem. It was, it, it was a follow-on agreement, uh, really, to the incidents at sea agreement. And it, it, pre it pre was targeted to prevent like laser, lasering aircraft. Uh, it, it had to deal with um, uh, inadvertent flights over other, uh, other territories of, you know, between uh, the Warsaw Pact and the uh, NATO. Well, what happened after 1989 is basically the Warsaw Pact went away uh, the, there was only one, there was a, a provision for one agreement uh, for an annual meeting between the two sides. Uh, again, this was a Ministry of Defense and a DO, uh, Department of Defense agreement signed between the Soviet Union and the United States and not an executive agreement. And once this, the, the Warsaw Pact collapsed, uh, they never, I think they met maybe twice. Uh, so the agreement is still on the books. And when I was uh, in uh, uh, Vienna two years ago to discuss the incidents at sea agreement, uh, I did mention that, you know, the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, you could take this uh, dangerous military uh, activities agreement and maybe make it your own in your relationships between, uh, you know, you have a situation now with Ukraine and uh, Russia, and uh, you know perhaps you could apply it, you know, uh, in that region of the world. So it, it's it's being looked at in in Europe again, but right now, as far as between Russia and the United States, uh, uh, it really has no application because, you know, the uh, uh, the former uh, Warsaw Pact and NATO borders have, have kind of gone away. So and we have. Yeah. Uh, between Poland uh, and I guess the uh, you know the Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, of course you have Belarus, which is kind of serving as a buffer. So, so is the um, you know prevention of uh, use of laser at the pilots and other things are they included in uh, some of the agreements and uh, between the U.S. and China? Uh, are they already in place? I uh, I hope so. Um, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> we no. should go out and go back and take a look. This is this is the the one thing about the incidents at sea agreement is that uh, uh, you know people say that well you got to update the incidents at sea agreement. What happens when you have the incidents at sea agreement is that every year the two delegations sit down and they have their discussions and then they sign an agreement a memorandum of understanding of what we agreed to. So. When they have this uh, memorandum uh, of what they they discussed, uh, things such as uh, uh, lasers, for example, mm -hmm. the, the provision for lasers actually is in one of these memorandums uh, in, in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. So you really didn't need to have it, uh, it put into oh, defense yeah. military, but it's it was or but the understanding is there. It's just not. Uh, uh, formalize yeah. uh, into the agreement. So, um, you know, what I would uh, hope is that, you know, between China and the United States, between their working groups and their plenary meetings, when they, they run into these uh, issues, they, they, they have their memorandum of understanding and it's res resolved there. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, I see one hands up and uh, let's invite the Professor Kentaro Furia. Would you like to unmute yourself and uh, speak up? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good morning uh, and uh, good evening to uh, Dr. Winkler because you are in the U.S. Uh, thank you very much for your informative presentation. I am so impressed with your historical perspectives. I have a question regarding the effectiveness of the cues that you said during your presentation and even the MMCA uh, in 19. 98 vis-a-vis uh, -vis INCSI, uh, that is agreement between the uh, USSR and the United States. 
it is often said that the INCSI is and was an effective uh, agreement because both sides understand uh, the importance of the uh, this document, whereas CUSE is not maybe not so much uh, because uh, this is not only a multilateral document but also the understanding of the for example uh, the importance of the document or even the interpretation of uh, each article in CUSE is somehow different and diverse. And in terms of MMCA, uh, when the accident, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I did not I remember the incident very clearly, but uh, there was incident between United States and China. And then uh, the United States uh, requested a consultative initiative upon MMCA, but not, that was not uh, open because the Chinese side rejected. So from this perspective, uh, how do you evaluate cues in terms of effectiveness? And if it is not effective, then I'd like you, uh, your opinion on what is necessary to make this document effective. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that is a very good question. And I think uh, one of the interesting uh, issues I found in my research was that um, uh, this, the Soviet Navy, uh, and this is a difference in culture, it, it's changing, but the Soviet Navy uh, really appreciates its lineage going back to Peter the Great and, as a sea service uh, that uh, you know, served uh, Mother Russia for you know, some 200 years. Uh, and the, uh, the, the Soviet naval officers and the American naval officers are very experienced. They, uh, they operate in the same dangerous domain in the, uh, uh, the northern oceans of the world. Uh, so there's, there, there's a bond, and I, and I point out that there, there's a, uh, quite often the American and Soviet naval officers uh, could talk and feel comfortable much more than, for example, American naval officers with their army counterparts. So there, there is a kinship and, uh, and, and bond between these, uh, these two sides. And, and, and the... Uh, China, the People Liberation Army Navy, uh, is is a really you know relatively new uh, animal. Now that this is this is changing, of course, uh, uh, but for, it's a People Liberation Army Navy, and the Army uh, during the 1990s and in in early 2000s, you know, they, they had quite a, a bit of influence. Uh, and quite frankly, the heads of delegation uh, to, to the talks, uh, you know, I discovered were, uh, uh, in some cases, were, were Chinese generals who uh, put on uh, naval uniforms. And the reason why they were selected to head the delegations were because they spoke good English. Uh, so this is, I think this is part of the problem is that the, uh, the Chinese Navy uh, is 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 starting to it, it is has been behind the curve as far as developing uh, you know a, a professional core of naval officers. That's changing. Okay, there, we're we're now getting into uh, you, know, uh, you know officers who came into the Chinese Navy you know two decades ago uh, you know and have been serving at sea are now uh, achieving the higher ranks. Uh, this was a problem, by the way, with the Soviet Navy when they went blue back in uh, uh, the 1960s from a coastal defense force, suddenly they're building these cruisers and they're putting very young officers in charge of these ships. And that's, that's, that was part of the reasons why they were having these, uh, in, in these incidences, because you had these very young, inexperienced officers in charge. I, I think you, you're going to see that... Uh, uh, with China as, 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 as they uh, develop professionally. Uh, as far as, you know, the interpretation of cues versus incidents at sea, I'd have to take, a, a, I'd have to look at this, you know, the specific uh, uh, incident on, on what the problem was. You know, maybe uh, 
uh, this might be a, ca uh, uh, a case that you re-examine and you say, well, maybe it's time to do a, a specific instance and see with China if there, if there are clarification problems. But I think, uh, uh, you know, cues is, is a, a much larger set of signals. And I think because it's a much larger set of signals, there could, there could be uh, issues with interpretation and that, that could be a problem. All right, so thank you. Um, if there's an, any no more question, let me wrap up the session. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we've learned, um, you know, some uh, history lessons from uh, the Cold War history from uh, Dr. Winkler. So if you would like to know more about it, uh, the lessons and history, um, please go out and uh, buy his book and uh, uh, read it. And actually, I mean, we can uh, kind of uh, sign agreements and come up with, uh, you know, kind of uh, document and other things. But I mean, this is ultimately people. This, we are only human and the people are doing the job. So there are a lot of uh, psychologies involved, uh, personalities are involved. So we have to really, uh, really re uh, learn lessons from the history of what we uh, people did. Uh, in reality during the Cold War. And another thing we might be able to do is to translate uh, Dr. Winkler's book into Japanese. And uh, if there is any volunteers, uh, please let, let us know. And we know that uh, we'll be competing uh, together, you know, with uh, China, with uh, Russia and other countries. Uh, we know that, so we we'll have to live with that, the reality. And uh, the question is how well we will be able to money, manage uh, the competition. So for that, we have to get together, the United States, uh, Japan, uh, India, and other countries in the Indo-Pacific region, hopefully we'll be able to get together and do a good job. And hopefully China will uh, play the game according to the rules and learn lessons from the history too. And it's a good news that, that they are reading the Chinese version of uh, Dr. Winkler's book. So thank you very much again, Dr. Winkler, for the excellent talk and uh, sophisticated, uh, sincere answers to our quest questions. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope we'll stay in touch and uh, you'll keep coming back to the GRIP seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs>